ذَلِكَ That is so. Meaning this is how it is. وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ And whoever honors شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ The symbols of Allah فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Then that is from the piety of the hearts. This is how it is. ذَلِكَ And when ذَلِكَ appears like this at the beginning of an ayah, it is to separate between two statements. That the one who does shirk, all of his good deeds are wasted. All of his good deeds are finished. And the only thing that he will face now in the hereafter is utter loss. And on the other hand, وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ And whoever honors, شَعَائِرَ Allah, The symbols of Allah. What are the شَعَائِر of Allah? شَعَائِر is a plural of شَعِيرَ And شَعِيرَ is from the root letters شِينْ عَيْنْ رَ And شَعِيرَ literally is used for a signpost. A signpost. Something that you see and it tells you where you're going, where you are. It signifies something. It reminds you of something. It tells you about something. Like for example, the moment you see a green sign, what does it tell you? A green sign on the road. That you're on the highway, right? Or you're close to the highway. You're getting onto the highway. And if you see a blue one, you're on the normal streets, roads. So, shahir are what? Signposts. You see them and they tell you about something. They signify something. They mean something. And from this, the word shahir is used for the religious rituals, the religious symbols that remind a person about the religion of Allah, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself, and the respect of all of these things and rituals is mandatory. We are obligated to respect them. There's a scholar, Shah Waliullah, he wrote in his book, Hujjatullah al Baligha. That sha'air of Allah, they refer to all of the apparent and tangible matters and things. What do they refer to? The tangible, the apparent things, the apparent, the physical objects, as well as times and places that have been appointed for the worship of Allah. That have been appointed for the worship of Allah. That through these times, through these places, through these things, what do you do? You worship Allah. Like for example, if a person has a beard. Now if you think of it, a beard itself is just hair on the face. But when a person has it, and he's kept it in obedience to the command of the Prophet ﷺ, that beard is what? Is a means through which he is worshipping Allah. And the beard, it should be respected. A person must not disrespect it. So you understand what sha'ir Allah are? There are things, places, times, apparent things through which a person worships Allah. And they remind a person of the deen of Allah. They remind a person of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their respect is mandatory. And Shah Wadiullah has written that these things and matters are so important and they're so special that their respect and sanctity is like the respect and sanctity of Allah. If a person respects them, in reality, who is he respecting? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And any kind of negligence towards them is considered to be negligence towards Allah. If a person falls short in respecting them, he is in fact falling short in his respect to who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said that the major shara'il Allah, there are four. The major shara'il Allah. How many are there? Four. First of all, the Qur'an. Secondly, the Ka'bah. Thirdly, the Prophet ﷺ. And fourthly, Salah. So he said there are mainly four sha'ir of Allah. But they are not the only ones. And other scholars, they have said that the sha'ir of Allah, they include the Kaaba, They include Arafah. They include Muzdalifah. They include the three Jamal, the three pillars. They include Safa Marwa. They include Mina. They include all of the Masajid. They include the month of Ramadan. They include the sacred months. Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Nahr. Similarly, the Ayyam al-Tashriq. It includes the Adhan. It includes the Iqama. It includes the congregational prayer. So if you look at it, Sha'a'ir Allah is everything that is a part of the religion of Allah. It's a ritual. 
And this includes the hijab. This includes the niqab. This includes, for example, for the men to fold up their pants so that their ankles are exposed. This includes, this is a part of Allah. The masjid is a part of Allah. The Qur'an, the study of the Qur'an, all of this is what? Sha'ir of Allah. So to summarize, the Sha'ir of Allah are what? They're the places, the objects, the times. Places, objects, as well as times. As well as rituals. Places, objects, times, as well as rituals that are meant for the worship of Allah, that remind a person of the deen. And the sha'ir of Allah also includes specifically those rituals or those places, times that are related to hajj in particular. Which is why we see that the sacrificial animals, even they are called sha'ir of Allah. Why? Because these sacrificial animals, they are taken for hajj and they are slaughtered over there. They remind a person of what? Of the worship of Allah. So, وَمَنْ يُعَظِمْ شَعَائِرَ Allah, Whoever honors and respects these symbols of Allah, فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ That is from the fear of the heart. That is out of the piety of the heart. So what does it teach us? That the more taqwa a person has, the more he will have respect for the شَعَائِرَ of Allah. And the less taqwa a person has, the less respect he will have for the شَعَائِرَ of Allah. It's an obligation on every single Muslim to respect anything and everything that has to do with the religion. Anything and everything that has to do with the religion. And if a person does not respect that in any way, he makes fun of it, or he discourages it, or he says, I don't think this is necessary. I don't think you should take the risk of doing this. When a person says such things, then in reality, what is he doing? He's disrespecting the sharia of Allah. So, وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ And we see that the Qur'an, it is of the major shair of Allah. Because when you hear the word Qur'an, when you see the Qur'an, what does it remind you of? Allah. It reminds you of religion. It reminds you of ibadah. It reminds you of tilawah. It reminds you of salah. So it's a major shair of Allah. And we also have to make sure that we respect it. Because respecting the shair of Allah, it's out of the piety of the hearts. So normally what happens, because we're studying the Qur'an, we consider the juz to be, or the mushaf to be like a textbook. Which is why sometimes it is seen being passed around as if it's any other note, because if it's any other textbook. But the fact is that what you have in your hand, what is it? It is the Qur'an. It is the book of Allah. Words of Allah. Similarly, sometimes people will have the Qur'an, the mushaf in their bags, and they'll throw their bag. And they don't realize that this bag, the one that they're throwing, has a Qur'an inside it. Or sometimes they will rest their feet on it. They will put it on the floor and they will sit themselves on the chair. This is not respectful at all. Or they will have the Qur'an on the table and they will jump over that table. They will walk over that table. This is not correct. Or sometimes it's the way that we are carrying it. It's the way that we are passing it. It's the way that we are writing on it. You see, the book of Allah is very precious. It deserves respect. And it's not appropriate if we're doodling on it. If we're drawing weird things on the sides. And that we're writing very badly. No, it's the book of Allah. If you're taking notes, take them properly. Put them down neatly. Because it's the book of Allah. And the more respect a person will have, the more properly he will deal with the book of Allah. فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ because sometimes they say that, you know, I went for Hajj and Umrah and people had the Mus'haf on the floor. It's just our Pakistani culture that we have to respect the Qur'an so much. No, no, it's just a book. Regardless of who you saw putting the Mus'haf on the floor, you saw them putting the Mus'haf right next to them, regardless of who you saw, the fact is that it's the book of Allah. And even though there is no text that tells you that you have to place the Mus'haf above, you cannot place the Mus'haf on the floor, what will tell you? What will tell you? It's the taqwa of the heart that will tell you what respect to give to the Qur'an. That will tell you this is appropriate and this is not appropriate. Similarly, when we're putting books, when we're placing books, sometimes we have a pile of books. We place the mushaf or the juice right at the bottom because it's big. And then we put the rest of the books on top. It should be the other way around. The mushaf, the book of Allah, should always be on the top. So we have to be very careful. 
Because whoever respects the sharair of Allah, فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Allah is telling us this. And a person who does not respect, what does it show? He lacks taqwa. He lacks taqwa. Which is not a good sign at all. Okay, we listen to the recitation, then we'll continue again. Don't all creamy. If you're in the kitchen, your hands are wet, they will not let you touch their phone. Why? Because a phone is very precious to them. Does it say in the book, in the manual, that don't touch it with wet hands? It might even say waterproof. It doesn't say anything like that in the manual. Who tells them? It's the heart. That this is a very precious phone. It's a very valuable phone. You're not supposed to touch it with dirty hands. Don't give it to a child. Don't do such and such. Because otherwise it will lose its value. So the more you like something, automatically you'll begin to respect it. Always people wonder, do I really have taqwa in my heart? Do I have taqwa or not? Isn't it? You always wonder. Because taqwa is a condition for so many things. Now here the test has been given. That whoever has respect for the shara'ir of Allah, the more respect he has, the more taqwa he has. So we have to see how much respect do we give to the Qur'an, how much respect do we give to the rituals of the deen, to the times of prayer, to the prayer itself. To the recitation of the Qur'an, the more importance we give to them, the more taqwa there is. The less importance we give to them, the less taqwa there is. And who's the best judge? You yourself. Many times it happens that people who have less knowledge of the deen, they have more respect. And people who get to know a little bit more, they tend to lose that respect. People who don't know much about what the Qur'an means, but the way that they will hold the Qur'an, the way that they will cover it up, the way they will wrap it up, the way they will put it on the shelf and they will take it off properly, very nicely, very respectfully, they will have their wudu and they will recite it very nicely. And what do we think? That, you know, you don't really need to have wudu, you don't have to touch it with your wudu, you can touch it without wudu as well. Although it is permissible, but the element of respect... One is that you just, you know, you have it open on your phone and you're going quickly whizzing through the Qur'an and then you're like, oh, somebody's talking to me? Press the home button, off goes the Qur'an. This is disrespect. That if you're reading, complete the ayah. If you're reading, complete the ayah. Complete the passage that you were reciting. Complete the surah that you were reciting. And if you go to that village back home where that woman is reading the Qur'an, even if you talk to her, she will not respond to you because she is spending her time with the Qur'an. So we see that with knowledge, taqwa must also increase. Respect must also increase. Ta'zim must also increase. Because remember, that the more respect a person gives, the more he receives. And the less respect a person gives, the less he receives. Okay, let's continue. لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ For you in it are manafir. إِلَىٰ أَجَلِ musamma Until a fixed term. Has been understood as the sha'ir of Allah. Because that is what was mentioned in the previous ayah. That in the sha'ir of Allah, there are for you benefits until a certain time. How? Because this is the context of Hajj. If we take it to be the rituals of Hajj, then there are benefits until a certain time. Like, for example, Arafah is only for some time, limited time. Muzdalifa, limited time. Tawaf, limited time. Sari, limited time. So until that time is over, you have some benefits. Meaning you have the opportunity to do as many good deeds as you want, read as much dhikr as you want, read the Qur'an, make dua. But as soon as the time is over, then what happens? That opportunity is also gone. And if we take the meaning of sha'ir of Allah to be specifically the sacrificial animals, because even they are called sha'ir of Allah, then in these animals there are benefits until a certain time. And what is that certain time? until they are to be slaughtered. Which is why some scholars, they have permitted using these animals, for instance, riding, if extremely necessary, because the ayah tells us that, لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ إِلَىٰ أَجْلِ مُسَمَّةِ Or for example, benefiting from their milk, it is permissible. But it's all permissible until a certain time, meaning until they are to be slaughtered. ثُمَّ then, مَحِلُّهَا It's place of being halal. Mahil is from the root letters halam lam and mahil is ism zarf. So mahil is the place of making an animal halal, meaning slaughtering the animal. 
Or Muhil is also understood as the place of undoing, opening the ihram. So, summa mahilluha ila al bayt al atiq to the ancient house. Meaning, where are the animals to be slaughtered? By the ancient house. Because we have learned earlier in Surah Al Ma'idah, ayah 95, that hadiyan baligh al ka'bati, an offering to Allah that is delivered to the Kaaba. The animals that are to be slaughtered at Hajj, you cannot slaughter them outside of the Haram. They have to be slaughtered within the precincts of the Haram. So, ilal bayt al atiq. Now, these days what happens? When you want to go and have your animal slaughtered, you can't do it yourself. But know that when you go and buy your ticket, they are going to slaughter it within the area of the haram. Because it says over here, ثُمَّ مَحِلُّهَا إِلَى الْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ That is how it's supposed to be. وَلِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ And for every ummah, for every nation, جَعَلْنَا We have made man sakan a ritual. Which ritual? Ritual of slaughtering animals. So every nation that went before the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from the Ummah of Adam alayhi salam to the Ummah of Musa alayhi salam to finally the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, for every single Ummah, Allah appointed for them a mansak, a ritual. Mansak is from the root letters nun, seen kaf, and nusuk is worship. But remember that nusuk is also used for sacrifice. In the salati, wa nusuki. So we have made for every Ummah a mansak, a ritual of slaughtering animals. لِيَذْكُرُوا So that they mention إِسْمَ اللَّهِ The name of Allah عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ Over what He has provided them مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ Of the four-legged animals. So every nation was commanded that they should offer sacrifice for the sake of Allah. And whenever they would offer sacrifice for the sake of Allah, what would they do? They would have to mention the name of Allah at the time of slaughtering. Why? Because فَإِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ واحد. Your God is one God. فَلَهُ أَسْلِمُوا So for Him only, all of you should submit. And when you have submitted to Him alone, then what does it mean? That إِنَّ صَلَاتِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ And give good news to those who become humble. مُخْبِتِينَ is the plural of مُخْبِت. And مُخْبِت is from خَبَتَ and khabt is used for very soft and low ground. Ground that is very soft and it's also low. And from this word, mukhbit is used for someone who is very humble in his nature. Very humble in his manner. Someone who is not tough and difficult to deal with, but they are very accommodating. Very accommodating. That whatever you tell them, they listen. And this is a very unique quality. And very few fortunate people have this quality. Recently somebody was saying about someone that I know they will listen. What will she say? She will say yes, she will agree. And I thought how nice that someone is witnessing to their ikhbat, that they are so humble that they will listen, they will agree, they will accommodate. Because generally what is our attitude? That if somebody tells us to do something, to change something, why me? Why me? Why should I change? You should change. But who is a mukhbit? Someone who is humble, someone who is so soft, you tell them about something, they accept it. It doesn't mean they are a pushover. It doesn't mean they don't have any confidence that that's why they listen to everything that you tell them. But rather it is that they're very accommodating. That if something good comes their way, if something right comes their way, instead of being stubborn, they accept. So, وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ So in this ayah, what do we learn? First of all, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that sacrifice in the name of Allah has been prescribed for all nations. That all people they were given the command that whenever they offer sacrifice, they should do it in the name of who? Allah alone. So we see that when it comes to the sacrifice, it is the practice of the righteous people from the beginning. From the time of Ibrahim salam and even before. And we learned that at the time of Adam salam, his two sons, what did they do? Is qarraba. Qurbanan, when both of them they offered a sacrifice. And Ibrahim salam, he also prepared himself to slaughter his own son. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced his son with who? With an animal. So we see that every nation, every people, they offered sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that Allah needs it. No, Allah does not need it. But it shows your commitment. It shows your dedication. It shows your love for Allah. 
The Prophet ﷺ said, The son of Adam does not perform any actions on the day of sacrifice, which is more pleasing to Allah than the shedding of blood. Than the shedding of blood of who? Animals. Meaning animals that are being slaughtered for the sake of Allah. And sacrifice, it should only be done for the sake of Allah. We also learn that فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ In Surah Al-Kawthar, that O Prophet ﷺ, what should you do? فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ That pray to your Lord and also offer sacrifice. Now, sacrifice is apparently a ritual. That you take an animal, you go slaughter it, you shed blood and you get the meat and you eat it and you give it to other people as well. But in reality, what is it? It teaches a person humility. Which is why at the end of the ayah, what does Allah say? وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ Because sacrifice is a demonstration of total submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is a proof of complete obedience to Allah's will and command. For us, perhaps it's not a big deal. Because we don't live with animals, we don't use these animals. So all we have to do is go pay for the animal and get it slaughtered. Simple. But even that actually, when you have to get all that money out, and when you have to give it for an animal to be slaughtered, even today in some places where people have these animals, they look after them themselves, they have maintained them themselves, and then they slaughter them, it really takes a lot of courage to do so. You know, sometimes it happens that, for instance, at their Eid when the animals are bought, they're bought, let's say, like two weeks before the actual day of Eid. And the children, they are taking care of the animal, and they get so attached to it that finally when the time of slaughtering the animal comes, they're crying, don't slaughter this goat. Go slaughter some other goat. This is my goat now. Why? Because you tend to develop a lot of attachment with the animal that you take care of. And you have a lot of attachment with your hard-earned money as well. So when a person is offering that animal for the sake of Allah, what does it show? Humility. Humility. That, oh Allah, this is what you want me to do? I'll do it. The animals also, people who are so attached to them, they can sense the goat or the sheep that, you know, it's crying. It's got tears in its eyes. And, you know, sometimes children are crying. I remember as a child, every time the animal would be brought and uh, the day, the time of the slaughter comes, that man comes with the big knife and off I would run into the washroom and close the door. I could not witness that scene. And there my sister would be going to pass the knife over the animal. So you develop a lot of attachment to the animal, especially when you've taken care of it, when you've spent so much time with it. So this is why it's a sign of submission before Allah. وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ Give good news to those who are humble before Allah. That Allah wants me to slaughter this animal? Okay, fine. 